Hello and welcome to the Rabblecast. My name is Eric Hernandez and you are listening to episode number 602, 602 if you keep your score at home. Um, we're back at it, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're going through a bunch of different things. In this episode, I'm going to be talking about the new Masters of the Universe on Netflix. That's right, Masters of the Universe, or if you know back in the day, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. I get into some of the history, um, the recent episodes that were released, the first five, part one, as they were labeled on Netflix, and there are spoilers, so be ready for that. If you haven't watched the series yet, the new one, I do talk about a few story points that will spoil some of the episodes for you, so be ready for that. Uh, we also talk about some of the news and controversy with some of the writers and how the fans took to the series. We'll get into it. A whole bunch of different things. But I don't want to ramble on like I did in the last intro. I'm trying to keep these this part short so you can enjoy the rest of the show as you're watching it. Whether it be uh, at home, at work, whatever the case is. With that being said, we are brought to you by InsidePulse.com. You can find us under the podcast section. You can also find us over at uh, Rabblecast.Libson.com where the show is posted up normally. Check our channel out on YouTube. YouTube.com slash Rabblecast. Like and subscribe over there for us, please. Uh, if you're on iTunes, give us a like and review the show. Uh, I, I mentioned at the end of this, I'm not really worried about ratings, so to speak. I just want the show to be accessible so people can find it easier. So if we get some rankings or certain good reviews, we'll see what happens. Give me a five star, four star, whatever the case is. Don't be a dick. Don't give me a one star. We'll see what happens. Uh, what else? Uh, Rabblecast Facebook fan page at Rabblecast on Twitter and emails Rabblecast at gmail.com. That simple, that easy. I hope, uh, I hope you're doing well. Aside from that, I hope you enjoy the show. Now that we're all set up, uh, we're trying to figure out how things are going to be moving schedule-wise. Uh, we'll get more into that later as the shows progress. Uh, welcome to the show, everybody. I hope you're having fun out there, whether you're getting up to start your day, you're at the gym, you're out for a walk, you're at work, whatever the case is. I'm hoping this is going to be a fun little distraction while you go about your normal routine. Uh, I was going to record late last week and try to put up another episode to just to try to keep you know continuity and schedule wise going but i figured it'd be a little bit better if i hold off because um netflix was going to be releasing the new masters of the universe on their streaming service and i figured you know what i've been waiting for this one for about two years now since they announced it on one of uh, kevin smith's podcasts uh, I can't remember if it was Fat Man Beyond or one of the other many, many podcasts that gentleman does. Uh, Kevin Smith is ridiculous. I, I've said I'm a fan of his. Easy mark for anything he does. That's no surprise here. But um, he had mentioned a couple years ago that they were going to be doing a partnership between himself, Netflix, and Mattel. And they wanted to create a brand new Masters of the Universe cartoon. Now... If you are familiar with He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, as the original cartoon was called, uh, if you get a chance, I highly recommend you go to Netflix and check out the Toys That Made Us episode on He-Man. It'll give you pretty much a brief, summarized rundown of the creation of He-Man. Uh, I'm going to summarize it myself even further, but if you get a chance, check that out, because the guys over at Toys That Made Us and the Movies That Made Us do some really great stuff. Um... He-Man and the Masters of the Universe was conceived first as a toy line, all right? The idea was in the 80s, they wanted to create a toy that can compete with Star Wars, uh, Kenner, and just pretty much take over the market share as much as possible. And when they did that, they just made it up as they went along. It's great to see the, um, the origin of the toys and who had what input and who claims to have created what character and what premise it gets lost into the you know the uh, the time history of time as far as who made what, but they all came together. They do these interviews with the uh, gentleman from the toys that made us, and they put together a great story. But you see that it started off as a, as a toy line. They went out and were trying to pitch it to different toy uh, vendors, and as the questions arose in these meetings, as far as like, well, 
what do, what do they have or what are they what, what demographic you're going to aim for and then eventually well how are you going to you know get a uh word out to the public and one of the creators i can't remember his name off the top of my head uh he says oh well, we're gonna have a comic book that goes with it and like a comic book and his partner looks over and goes oh, a comic book you're know, you know, like shut up don't <laughs> don't don't ruin it um so they said okay we're gonna make this toy line and then we're gonna make a, a comic that's going to present the story for anybody who buys the toy and you can from there get a better understanding how it's gonna go as far as he-man and, and skeletor and the struggle for power and the uh, the power sword and castle Grayskull and snake mountain how this all comes together certain elements were conceived in the comic for he man and the masters of the universe uh, and then from there when they went further and they were actually getting into different rooms and people were, were actually like buying into the idea of he man they said well you know what else are we gonna do as far as like getting more uh, hitting our demographics and they're like oh we're gonna make a cartoon and the guy's like a cartoon shut the fuck up so a cartoon was then conceived <laughs> to go along with this this toy line to go along with the comic book and everything else so he-man and the masters of the universe if you watch the the documentary or the little uh mini episode documentary on the toys and madness there are other documentaries out there on he-man and the masters of the universe but this property is a very good example of fake it until you make it because they were just trying to find something that was going to sell toys. They figured, okay, let's get out there. Let's find our audience, uh, little boys. We want to want them to play, you know, with these action figures, we want them big and muscular and show that they're, they're strong and have these crazy characters. I mean, you, if you look at some of the names, the names are just ridiculous when it comes to uh, the characters in He-Man. He you've got Roboto, you've got Skeletor, you've got Beastman, you've got Clawful, Merman, um, Trapjaw, Triclops. I mean, go on and on and on. Some of the names are just crazy, outlandish, and purely out of the 80s. But it worked. This, this toy line birthed so much in terms of money and revenue that it worked not only did it work but it it found a following i remember growing up and i would see my brother's action figures and you know you would put little power swords together so he-man had his gray or silver power sword and skeletor would have his purple one and you could actually put them together back to back and they would make the the power sword quote unquote i don't think we ever had castle grayskull growing up but I, we had a number of the toys he-man skeletor Triclops, Beast Man, uh, Manny Faces, um, you name it. They had a bunch of them. My parents, you know, did whatever they could to keep the, my, my older brothers uh, happy when they were growing up. So I remember seeing all the, the figures, and they were just big, hulking pieces of plastic that weren't really poseable. Not, they didn't have any uh, points of articulation. I think their shoulders moved back and forth, the, uh, the, the hips, uh, or at least the waistline, and then the legs. That was that, and the head. Nowadays, you've got articulating points in the wrists and the fingers and the neck and the shoulders and the abdomen. It, it was ridiculous what they made back in the day, but that's what you had. And people loved it. Now, with the new series that was put out, uh, it's just called Master of the Universe because apparently somebody else owns the title of uh, He-Man in the Masters of the Universe. Um, Kevin Smith, when they made this announcement of the new series that was coming to Netflix... Uh, we had to wait for quite some time, but then as more and more information came out, people were getting excited. They're like, oh, this is going to be kind of interesting because the the voice cast alone uh, became really interesting as they kept uh, announcing different things going forward. Let's see if I can bring up the voice cast right here. Uh, Prince Adam was played by Chris Wood. Uh, excuse me, Prince Adam slash He-Man. Actually, something I found out recently, the idea of the alter ego was created by uh, the comics for He-Man. I never knew that. See, I grew up on the cartoon itself, so I never knew that Prince Adam was a construct of another uh, iteration of the of, of He-Man. I didn't realize that. Um, Chris Wood, if you've watched Supergirl, I can't remember the character he played on there. He played one of the other Kryptonians that falls in love with Supergirl in that series run. He came over to do He-Man and Prince Adam for this series. Mark Hamill was tapped for Skeletor. And I got annoyed when I was looking online and somebody actually commented, oh, Mark Hamill just brings his Joker voice to, to do Skeletor. 
Correction, motherfucker. <laughs> Mark Hamill brings Mark Hamill's voice to do Skeletor. If you go back and watch the 90s Spider-Man cartoon from Fox, uh, I hate to say it, yes, you're right in the sense he's bringing his Joker voice. When Mark Hamill voiced the Hobgoblin on Spider-Man, it sounds like Mark Hamill, so it's going to sound like the Joker. Yes, there are subtle nuances and subtleties to the voice and performance, but after watching the first five episodes in part one of the new Masters of the Universe on Netflix, yes, he does sound like the Joker. But that's Mark Hamill. That's what his voice sounds like. It's fucking amazing. It's awesome to see Skeletor get a uh, such a great performance. Not that the other gentleman, uh, something Oppenheimer, can't remember off the top of my head. I mean, the old... Um, grinning, grimacing, laughing Skeletor from the 80s cartoon. Not that it wasn't great. It, it was what it was. It's what you expected and what you <laughs> generally got. But the voice cast this time around definitely steps it up quite a bit. Let's see who else. Uh, Liam Cunningham is Duncan or Man at Arms. Sarah Michelle Geller as Tila. Uh, this became really interesting because I remember when I saw her cast as Tila, I figured, okay, she, there's got to be more to it because they they can't just cast somebody who's so prominent in TV and acting, and just put him as a supporting character, which I'll get to more on that in a second. Uh, Lena Hetty, if you remember her from uh, the Sarah Connor Chronicles, Game of Thrones, uh, I'm blanking on some of the other stuff that she's been in lately, but uh, the 300, I believe she was in, uh, she comes and lends her amazing voice to Evil Lynn, to which at this point, I can't even think of the previous voice actress. Again, not to take anything away from the old guard necessarily of He-Man, but they definitely did a great job this time around. Dietrich Bader is King Randor uh, and Trapjaw. Alicia Silverstone is Queen Marlena. Stephen Root is Cringer. Stephen Root, a great character actor. Uh, who else? Griffin Newman is Orko. Orko gets fucking badass this time around. Susan Eisenberg is Sorceress of Gray uh, Castle Grayskull, and I can go on and on. Kevin Michael Richardson is Beastman. Kevin Conroy previously Batman, is Merman. Uh, Henry Rollins is Triclops, who has a really interesting turn this time around. Jason Mewes, Kevin Smith's buddy, uh, is Stinkor. Alan Oppenheimer, thank you, there it is. Alan Oppenheimer, who was previously Skeletor in the old He-Man, plays Mossman this time around. Justice Long is Roboto. Tony Todd is Scareglow. Trust me, the character is much cooler than the name. Uh, Phil Lamar is Hero. You'll see him later on uh, in the episodes. Cree Summer is the Priestess and Kaduk. Harley Quinn Smith is uh, Elena, uh, Kevin Smith's daughter, not the DC character. Uh, Tef Tiffany Smith is Andra. Dennis uh, Haysbert is King Gray Grayskull. Adam Gifford is Victor. And Jay Tavari is uh, Wondar. So that's just an idea of voice casting as far as what they're going to get into as far as this is concerned. This, unfortunately, was brought with some controversy, this series. And I think it's mainly because of who heads up the writing team. Now, Kevin Smith, Mark Bernardin, uh, I know those two names off the top of my head because I listened to Fat Man Beyond. I've mentioned it uh, in previous episodes on this show. Um, both great minds when it comes to writing, both very different styles, but they pull together not only their style but other young up-and-coming writers who have been working on various different uh, TV and movie come together to make this great show. Now, as far as I can recall, the original plan was for Netflix to release all 10 episodes at once on their streaming platform, but somewhere down the line they decided to they were going to split it in half. And I think what it comes down to is they want to try to spread it out as far as all the different IP that they have on their platform. They did something similar with some of the other animated shows that they've had on their platform in the past. Uh, the recent She-Ra Princes of Power, which was another re reboot, reimagining of the original property. This, uh, I should mention, this compared to She-Ra, uh, She-Ra was a reboot of the animated series and Masters of the Universe pretty much continues the 83-84 cartoon from back then and uh, picks up where they left off, in a sense. It, it does acknowledge a lot of the previous history of that cartoon where Shira had uh, played a little looser with that as far as that's concerned. Voltron was another one that was brought in from DreamWorks. That one reimagined a, a lot of the elements of the storyline, but they kept a lot of things that you would expect besides the 
giant robot that is comprised of five robot lions. I'm getting a little uh, off base here. Um, Mark Bernard and Kevin Smith, they came together with a bunch of other writers and they put together this amazing team, amazing story. And what it came down to is they said, hey, look, we want He-Man to be He-Man, but we want you to make it more realistic in the sense that it was said, look, they run around with all these weapons and blasters and swords. Let's actually make it so that there's stakes. So there's there's the possibility of something happening. Uh, and I'm going to spoil the fuck out of this right now. The first episode, you finally get that big battle, that big showdown between Skeletor and He-Man. And at one point, somebody gets stabbed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right through the torso. And it's even mentioned, you finally use that sword the way it's supposed to be used. And it's quite interesting to see it because you're like, oh, wow, all this time, like they've bat been battling back and forth. At the end of the old cartoon back in the 80s, essentially, whatever problem or scenario was, you know, concocted for that episode, by the end of that episode, everything was reset. Every there was no death, no no consequence, there was no stakes. So there was no worry about anybody dying or getting hurt long term. It would all just go away. At the end of the first episode, people die. <laughs> they they have a big battle at Castle Grayskull, and we lose some characters. Now this kicks off the controversy that came, uh, and I and I, I I would say it's because of Kevin Smith, but it's not his fault solely. Like, I'm not even blaming him. It's not even his fault at all. Let's put it that way. Um, a lot of the fandom started going after Kevin Smith for not being a quote-unquote true He-Man fan. That's fine. I, I, I would understand that. He-Man uh, He is a special... I don't want to say IP. What can I say? Ha has a special fandom. All right? Just like anything. I, I'm, I'm head over heels for Transformers. Am I a fanatic like some of these other people who go crazy? No, I... I I, I can take it, I, G1 is my, my bread and butter, I love it so much, but I can take some of the other ones as they're being released. In fact, there's a new season of uh, Transformers uh, War for Cybertron coming out on Netflix in the next couple days. The fandom for a lot of these properties or a lot of these franchises gets kind of out of hand after a while, to the point where saying that it's toxic just sounds so silly nowadays. It just... You've got your fans who love the property, enjoy it for what it is, and buy the toys and the merch and everything else. And then you've got these people that just believe that they are the end-all, be-all of that franchise. They know it inside and out, and they know how it should be, and it's stupid if you don't do it their way, and if it doesn't follow, you know, live up to their standards, it sucks. Well, that contingent of fans came out in force. And I wouldn't say that they're the majority, they're just the vocal minority in a lot of these cases. Well, they'll come out and they'll just attack whatever they don't like. Even though it's a franchise that they love. Which blows my fucking mind. I'm thinking of the Star Wars uh, fandom with the newer movies that came out and everything else. I understand. I get it. Each one has its own thing going on. But it gets kind of silly because after a while they're like... They started asking questions. Oh, this better not be a woke he man, and uh, you, you better not fuck this up. You better not ruin my childhood. Like, all right, people, like, you can still go back and watch the hundred plus episodes of the old cartoon, plus the other uh, reboots or reiterations of the cartoon from the eighties on forward. If you're that hell bent over this property, nobody's taking away the old ones from you. They're still there. All right, this is a new one for a new generation. If you're like me. I'm older, so I can actually sit down and watch this with my son. And if he enjoys it, maybe we'll go hunt down some toys. Or maybe I'll go hunt down some old episodes and, like, look, here. In fact, my friend Dan got me a DVD of He-Man uh, and the Masters of the Universe, the old episodes. And I could watch them with my son. I can show them the, the ridiculousness, the silliness, the public service announcements at the end of each episode. And it's just... <laughs> I don't know if I want to torture him that much. But we'll see what happens. What it comes down to is that these fans sometimes will ruin it for others. And it gets silly. So when this whole thing started going out and people were asking, hey, does He-Man die? And such, and such Okay. Realize that this is a story. I think Netflix did the property a disservice by splitting it into two parts. So five parts, uh, five episodes in one part, the next five later this year. 
had they released it all together, you would have gotten the full storyline and you would have a better picture of what's going on. The way this first five episodes go, yes, we lose some characters and I'm going to say, yes, He-Man dies in the first episode. Then after that, whatever time passes, I'm trying to figure out what between episodes one and two, they really don't give you a clear um, distinction as far as how much time has passed. Um, so He-Man dies and then the revelation of he-Man and Prince Adam were one of the same. So King Randor and Queen Marlena, they're upset. They're, they, they have to come to terms with the fact that their son perished and they didn't realize, well, at least the queen knew, the father did not, the king, uh, that their son and He-Man were one of the same. Uh, Tila gets upset because her friend has been keeping the secret from her. Uh, everybody's been keeping secrets, so she runs off from the kingdom. Duncan gets uh, exiled and stripped of his title, so he's no longer man-at-arms. It becomes this whole thing. Now, Tila goes off on her own, and she has to try to figure out how to live in Eternia, not being part of the royal guard in the, the whole kingdom. This brings good guys and bad guys together in this odd relationship now, because after the battle at Castle Grayskull, magic, the magic of Eternia is waning. It's its starting to disappear slowly but surely. So now a quest has been begun where uh, Evil Lynn hires Tila to go looking for certain art, magical artifacts. And this kicks off a quest where now they have to try to restore the magic of Eternia. And in doing so, bringing back some characters that we lost in the first episode. It... It sounds crazy, right? It's it's fantasy, sci-fi, magic, and mysticism, and medieval setting. Can you bring back a character that you've killed off? Fuck! <laughs> who, who thought of this? Um, it's it's nothing new. You kill off a character in, in the comics and movies and in cartoons, eventually they find the way to bring him back. Well, in this case, in this storyline... You're going to have that happen where you have to now hunt down these magical artifacts and bring them back together. The magical artifacts, I should mention, are the uh, the power sword. Uh, at the end of the battle, the swords were actually split in two, so you get to see two different versions of the power sword. Once they're separated, they look differently. Once they merge together, they look like the classic He-Man sword that we all know and love. Especially when he raises it up and claims, I have the power! That whole thing. It's fucking awesome. Um, speaking of which, the, the transformation in episode one of He-Man where... He is called upon, and he goes to Castle Grayskull, but before then he raises the sword up in the air, and he does the whole transformation thing. It's, it's very, like, this time around, it's a very, like, overblown Sailor Moon type of um, transformation, which is pretty fucking cool. Not as sexy. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Cringer, especially when he gets transformed into Battle Cat, you get to see that when the armor starts appearing on, on his bag, and he just becomes this big monster as opposed to, like, a, a, a Frady Cat, more or less. The storyline is that of fleshing out these characters. Tila, Man-at-Arms, uh, Duncan, I should say, uh, Evil Lynn, um, Beastman, Roboto, Orko, uh, Triclops, Trapjaw, all these characters, they are now given ba more backstory. They're given more depth that we didn't have in the original uh, cartoon run. I didn't, really didn't get into the later runs of the cartoons. It was like a futuristic He-Man and then a, a back to like bare bones He-Man later on down the line. I didn't get a chance to watch those. They, they were not in my wheelhouse at that time. Now here I am, what, 30, 40 years later, the nostalgia has hit me. So as soon as they announced it, I was all, I was all, all on board. But the story and the controversy that came out of this one is that this story focuses on Tila and not He-Man. Okay, this reminds me and I didn't read the full run, but this reminds me, a few years back, Marvel Comics had a storyline where it was revealed that Captain America had actually been a Hydra agent all along. At the one, there was that one comic that came out and that has where he kills one of the S.H.I.E.L.D. agents and it reveals him saying, Hail Hydra. And fans got pissed. They got upset to the point where they're giving death threats to the writer of the storyline saying, you, you can't do that to Captain America. That's not... Okay, people. I get it if you're upset. I get it if you want to talk about it. That's great. Let's not go to the point where we're just fucking throwing death threats. Just because we don't agree with something. Let's talk about it. Let's go through it. Let's see what the possible options are as far as the storyline is concerned. 
it makes more sense if you give it time to play out and maybe they might reveal what's going on and in fact in that run of captain america in marvel comics spoiler it was revealed to be a um, cosmic cube change or a uh, plot device where they changed something in reality which for a time made captain america a, a hydra agent and made him a bad guy but it was revealed that you know later on during whatever battle and scenario they had to go through that things were reversed because at the end of most storylines depending on what you're reading or what you're watching most things go back to the status quo every now and then now things are getting a little bit edgier so they want to give higher stakes sometimes they'll go a little bit different where they'll change something or the character loses something or someone and things now have to progress in a different direction from that point um he-man and the masters of the universe didn't really give us much. Again, I refer that as to the 80s cartoon. Everything was reset after each episode. Each episode was more or less standalone, where you can go in, you can see the good guy versus bad guy, the silly quips from Skeletor, uh, Beast Man acting moronic, whatever the case was. It was reset at the end of each one and the beginning of each new episode. It was back to normal. This time around, like I said, at the end of episode one, we lose people. He- He-Man being one of them. Um, and that idea now is... What do these characters do in response to that? How do you move forward when you find out your best friend has been lying to you? How do you move forward when you find out that this world is changing and the the old the old evil or more or less that was you know uh, plaguing the land is no longer there, but new evils pop up to take its place the The idea of the power vacuum if you remove one bad thing well what moves in its place, maybe something even worse, possibly, to fill that void. Um, In that respect, the storytelling for this new Masters of the Universe is a lot of fun. You get to see these characters have to deal with consequence and circumstance that you didn't see in previous iterations. So because of that, hats off or, you know, a round of applause for Kevin Smith and the writing team because they did a great job. They make you care about some of these supporting characters that you really didn't think of. Yeah, I'm sure you were a fan of Duncan or you are a fan of uh, Trap Draw, whatever the case was. The fact that they were able to take these characters, give them more depth, more backstory, have them interact with one another. This is a great scene between Evil Lynn and Orko where they relate to one another because they're both magic users, where you realize, oh, okay, this is something that you didn't see in the previous versions of the cartoon or the comics. You get to see Duncan try to deal with the fact that Tila is his daughter and he he loves her but he has his duty that he has to try to fulfill for the uh for the king for the crown and that's more important to him than just about anything else so he has to come to those realizations these different things and I I don't want to spoil everything for you but the way it's laid out the story the way it's told I'm I was very impressed I was very satisfied With the first five episodes. I can wait a month, two months, three months, whatever the case is. Supposedly by the end of the year we might see it, if not maybe early next. Where we'll see the the ending of this storyline. Now, I'm hoping, it hasn't been announced yet. I'm hoping that Netflix greenlights further seasons. Voltron, I can't remember how many seasons it ended up in. But like seven seasons came out in like three to four years. Because Netflix was just hot-shotting them. They would release one in, like, December, and then all of a sudden, like, three or four months down the line, another season would come out. And you're like, how the fuck are they making them so fast? Well, they've had enough production time, they're moving with it. Supposedly, the f- the first five for He-Man, um, excuse me, for, I'm going to abbreviate this, Masters of the Universe, MOTU, M-O-T-U, uh, was done quite some time ago. Now they had already finished up the second five. So even though people are clamoring, saying, oh my god, this sucks, or whatever the case is, no, the story is really good. It's a lot of fun. The second five are already completed. They just have to wait until they're released. I hope that Netflix greenlights this for further seasons. Because if we have this kind of storytelling going on, this sounds really cool. This this storyline that they've laid out, we could have some really interesting things happen now as they progress with these characters the way that they're written currently. With that being said, there is another iteration of He-Man coming out, a CG cartoon... That's going to be released sometime, I don't know if it's early next year, or down the line further than that. So, 
it's been said, if you don't like this version of He-Man, which I don't know why you wouldn't, unless you, you know, just are impatient, uh, if you don't like this version or the previous versions, there's another one down the line that you might like even more. In fact, there's even an animated movie that's might that's being talked about that might be released down the line as well, along with another possible live action. Fans of <laughs> fans of the old '80s uh, Masters of the Universe with Dolph Lundgren. Um, it's one of those so bad it's good movies in a sense. It, it's a weird, that one has its own story and craziness as well, but. That was a classic example of uh, bad writing, where budgets really hampered, hamstring the uh, the production. Where, how do you make a He-Man movie that's not He-Man? You you take him out of Eternia to begin with, you put him on Earth, you have him meet up with these Earth characters, these you know teenage kids, uh, young Courtney Cox is one of them, and then you now have this weird battle play out on Earth. With these futuristic vehicles and these alien type mercenaries, uh, it, it got really weird. But that's something you can go check out on your own. Um, highly recommend it though, because it's actually a lot of fun, uh, for, especially for Frank. Uh, oh God, Frank Langella as uh, Skeletor, which was an amazing, <laughs> amazing portrayal. And I feel really bad for him as far as the makeup he had to put on, as far as playing uh, the, the part of Skeletor. But. This is my take on, on He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. If you don't like it, you can tell me the F off very easily. But like I said, I'm I'm not going to sit here and harp about the bad things. Because there's not really much you can really nitpick on the He-Man uh, on this version of, of the show. It's brand new. First five episodes, they, they really swing for the fences. In my opinion, they do a really good job. They've got some time to tell the rest of the story. The next five episodes, we'll have to wait. But... If you look back at what it was, again, started as a toy line, birthed a comic that would you know be packaged with the toys itself, then that led into a com- uh, cartoon series to further sell the uh, the franchise and the toys, and it's all about toys. Like, you know, let's not kid ourselves. The '80s spawned a bunch of different franchises and cartoons that really were just 23 minute long commercials for toy toy lines. Uh, if you look at let's see. Uh, there's a whole bunch of my group watching, uh, Centurions, Transformers, um, oh God, Mask, uh, Mobile Armored Strike Command, um, I'm gonna be, <laughs> Visionaries, uh, G.I. Joe was a huge one. These were all franchises that were made, but they, the main goal was to sell toys. In fact, if you go to the early 2000s, Young Justice that was on Adult Swim Cartoon Network, they uh they had a really really good version of Young Justice going for a couple of seasons. I think it was like one or two seasons, but then got canceled shortly thereafter. Even though the fans loved the show, and they cited the fact that they weren't selling enough toys to justify producing the series. So because of that, they decided to can it. But years later, it was also further revealed that not only were they not selling enough toys, but they were saying that they're Demographic was supposed to be boys, but they found that girls were watching the cartoon as well. But the problem is that girls weren't buying the toys. Well, that's that sounds like an old way of thinking when it comes to these these shows. Y- yes, I get you want to sell toys, you want to sell merchandise, you want to try to make more revenue off of the property. But if you've got a great storytelling vehicle going, why would you stop? Years later, with uh, when they made the DC Universe app. And now I believe that's all under the HBO Max app. That whole um, I might get back to that and, and tell that story. Um, now everything's fallen under the HBO Max umbrella. Now we have a better uh, chance of seeing further uh, seasons because they brought back Young Justice, and the storytelling and the writing again was amazing. Do they have toys to sell for that one? Yeah, and now a lot of those people who were watching back then in early two thousand. Are a little bit older now. They have jobs and they have income. They can buy the the toys, the T-shirts, whatever other merch you want to create. But let's tell a good story because that will sell more than anything, and that's that's what people really want to be engaged in. If you can get that going first, I mean, look at a. I'll go back to the first and only season of uh, the show Firefly. One season of a show, and that still lives. And such, you know, high praise as far as fandom is concerned. You know, Joss Whedon, 
another story. I'm just talking about the storytelling itself, the characters. They did such a great job with that that property that people still love it to this day and will still buy things based off of that that franchise. Same thing with He-Man. At the end of that uh, episode I was mentioning before, The Toys That Made Us on Netflix, you see that at one point there was another uh, a toy company that decided to remake the toys based off of the classic design. So they took the old molds and the old toy designs and just made them beefier and larger. And I mean, like, you you, you saw, like, uh, pretty much just updated the toy designs as far as more articulation, more uh, detail, more weapons, you know, just stuff that fans wanted to see. And some of the freaking designs were just ridiculous. The remastered or the re- uh, recast Castle Grayskull, the old one was pretty cool in and of itself. I mean, it was just a large piece of plastic, but the newer ones, the, the paint, the detail... The overall design just makes it that much more realistic. It, it looks like it literally jumps off of your TV screen and now in your living room. So some of those toys and statues, they look really, really cool. And again, it it all started from the fandom back then. These people grew up watching this, enjoying this, and wanted to see this. I remember when I told my brother about the uh, upcoming release of Masters of the Universe from O2. And he was oh, this is kind of cool. And he took a look at it and he was excited. He was excited because he watched those episodes growing up so for him just like me it was like a time machine going back into the mid 80s uh mid uh to early 80s and watching this revival of something that you enjoyed as a child you, you don't get to see it that often like i would love um for the transformers series that's currently on netflix it's cgi it's great it, it, it is fun for what it is not my favorite version of transformers but it's a continuation in another iteration of that show would I have loved for them to go back to the G1 animation style? Absolutely. I would lose my mind. In fact, there's even the rumors of them possibly doing a follow-up to the uh, 1986 Transformers movie. If they do, I'm all over that. I'd be excited as all hell. But uh, there's something that you lose in translation when you change it from one medium to another. So if it was live action that you watched the show, let's say, like, uh, another one from the 90s. If you grew up watching Power Rangers and then suddenly like, oh, let's make a cartoon. Okay, it'll be fun. It, it won't be the same. Uh, voices will be different. Obviously, the, the style will be different because of the media. But Motu, they kept the animation style and it looks very similar to the old style. Now, Filmation had its own style. Don't get me wrong. But this 2D style of anima- animation excuse me, uh, looks really really good it looks crisp it looks clean and they have other elements that they put in there because they they literally take scans of some of the vehicles for the toys and and they put them into the show so any opportunity to sell toys they'll they'll, trust me they'll take it but um transformers they decided they wanted the the cg animation of it which is fine they look good the the detail is there and when they transform it works they they have those um transitions that look, they look really good but for me it loses something a little bit i'm still gonna watch it i'm enjoying it it's fun i can't wait for the conclusion uh, i believe it's called uh transformers war for cybertron kingdom so i'm looking forward to that i'm sure i'll talk about it in another episode but uh yeah it, it's interesting to see the controversy that came out for this one and it's because again it's with anything that gets remade anything that gets rebooted or re uh i don't want to say reformatted but uh, a, re- a restart on something. Like um, the all-female version of Ghostbusters was a reboot. And people were like, oh, fuck that because it's all women. I don't know what this this knee-jerk reaction just because you want to put a woman into a role that was previously a man. Can that happen? Yeah, sure, you can do it. If they do it well. Was that Ghostbusters movie with uh, Kristen Wiig? Uh, I'm... Melissa McCarthy, <laughs> and I'm blanking on the other two, currently off the top of my head, uh, Leslie Jones, and I can't remember my favorite. Fuck, it's been a while since I've watched it. There's too much stuff floating around my head. But uh, was that a good movie as far as reboot? It was fun in the retelling of the story and their their way. Did it live up to the original? No. The, the original is what it is. Let's face it. Uh, there is a newer Ghostbusters movie coming out. Uh, Ghostbusters Afterlife, which continues the story from the second all-male version of the original Ghostbusters, so we'll look forward to see what happens there. But I'm sure there's going to be people going out there as well saying, oh, you, you, you fucked it up and you didn't do this, you didn't do that. Again, 
nobody's ruining the originals. Nobody's ruining the early versions of these. If you want them, they're out there. We live in a world where if you really, really want to hold on to your childhood, you can literally buy it online. Go buy the episodes. Go buy the, the tape, the VHS, the, the DVD. I'm sure you can find it whatever format you'd like. It's still out there. You can enjoy it all day long if that's what you want. These companies are going to re, uh, reboot or re-release things because it's there. It's their property. They're going to make it. You know, capitalism is what it comes down to. The bottom line is the dollar. They're going to want to make as much money off of these properties as possible. Motu is off to a great start with this reimagining, this restart of the series. Can you enjoy it? Absolutely. Can you be patient with the storyline? Like, can you, let's put it this way. Are you the kind of person when you walk into work on Monday morning and somebody's trying to tell you the story about what happened to them over the weekend? Oh my God, you wouldn't believe this. And then suddenly you trail off and listening to them. You don't know who's talking to who or what belongs to what, whatever the case is. You just like, it's Monday morning, you've drawn that like, fuck man, just, just get it over with already. Just t tell me the final thing of the story. Or are you somebody who actually listens and are attentive to your friend or coworker? They're not usually the same thing, but can you get through a story? Even a, a short story that somebody's trying to relate to you from a weekend adventure. If you can, great. If you can make it to the end and then judge their story by what they're telling you throughout everything, awesome. If you're going to listen to part of the story, I'm like, well, you're fucking stupid. <laughs> then what's the point? At, at, at that point, it's... They're wasting their time telling you the story, and you're wasting uh, your time by just sitting there complaining about it. There's no point in complaining about something you don't like. If you don't like it, don't don't watch, don't listen. There is many more things. Or there are many more things to watch or listen to out there. You can go find something that does entice you, that does entertain you. I don't understand this whole thing of, I don't like this, so I'm going to scream to the holy high heavens as far as to why I don't like this, and I'm going to tell everybody else why they shouldn't like it either. No, that that's, that's pointless, and... It's kind of silly. There was a story, again, told by Kevin Smith, that uh, the some of the higher-ups in Netflix are actually enjoying the fact that this whole uh, woke He-Man or this, you know, Tila as He-Man uh, narrative has come out because it's brought more attention to the series and more people are going to want to watch it now. That's fine. That works. There's, you know, it's the old adage of that there's no such thing as bad press. It works. If you get more attention, even through bad press, hey, more eyeballs are going to be on your property, and hopefully more people are going to enjoy it. But you're going to get, again, that vocal minority that's just going to go out there and say, we don't like this, we don't know why you're screwing up our childhood. <laughs> A lot of these people probably didn't even grow up watching it. They're just jumping on the bandwagon. That's my guess at the very least, but I don't know. I, like I said, I'm not going to sit here and harp on the, all the, the bad things. I just found it interesting that because Kevin Smith was involved in the relaunching of Motu, that this became a whole thing where just social, uh, excuse me, social justice warriors and the liberal um, agenda in Hollywood, whatever the case is. I'm not, yes, I'm sure you can, you know, connect the dots however you want and it makes whatever picture you're, you're looking to create. Look, I'm looking to have a fun time. Masters of the Universe, excuse me, I can't even say the freaking title. Masters of the Universe on Netflix is a fun watch. They bring characters that you haven't seen. Characters who haven't weren't even in the original cartoon. They were just created for the toy line. But now they're actually in the cartoon itself. Uh, Stinkor makes a cameo in the second episode, which is a lot of, a lot of fun to watch. Um, all these little bits and pieces. like You, you see that somebody created this storyline way back then. Again, story, comic, car cartoon lives on to what it is today. But to see it now evolve and change through the the filter of a new writing team, it's pretty fucking cool. Like, that's... I, I give them credit for what they created. And I hope this team, if they don't get a chance to continue working on this, I hope that they get to work on some other amazing projects down the line. Because they've, they've knocked it out of the park with just the first five. Who knows? Maybe at the end of the, the next five, I could possibly say, well, you know what? It was a good storyline halfway through. <laughs> the last two or three, not so much. But I, I'm, I will patiently wait 
watch them when they're released. Because for me, look, I'm already paying for Netflix. So for me, it's, it's, I'm not losing or gaining anything other than I get to watch a few hours of further entertainment. And in a world like today, sometimes we need something to distract us, keep us busy. And so far, I think that Netflix has done a great job taking some of these older properties and giving them new life or a new lease on life at the very least. Voltron, I, I love the old Voltron cartoons, but if you try to go back and watch the old Voltron series, um, it's very politically driven. And there's a lot of dialogue that you're just like, please, can we just get to the Roe Beast in the battle at the very end? I know how it turns out. I know the team's in peril for a short while and then they form Voltron and they get the upper hand and then the Roe Beast gets stronger and then they have to form the Blazing Sword or the uh, or the, the emblem, the cross that comes out of the chest, whatever the case is. And they eventually slice the beast in half. And Voltron saves the day. Again, resetting the status quo at the end of every episode. I, I, I know that. I know the formula. I've, I've lived through it. I've seen it happen time and time again with all these series. This time around, uh, the newer Voltron series, which is a lot of fun. It's got like an anime style to it. A lot of fun to watch. Uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones that they've done lately. But they, they are now uh, scooping up some of these old properties and bring them back another one not not from netflix uh, although i think it might be on netflix when it finally comes out uh silverhawks is another one i remember way back when i don't re- remember too much of the series i just enjoyed it for what it was back in the day another one that had a toy line that you know you watch it watch the the cartoon and it's pretty much a long uh, commercial for the toys and go buy the toys and have fun and rinse and repeat um i like that some of these old cartoons are getting remade or redone with a new style or a new flair. It gives them, I guess that gives them new life and, and people get to another chance to enjoy them. If it's not by themselves, hopefully with uh, their friends or hopefully with their, with their family. The fact that I get to watch Transformers with my son, it's amazing. I, I could not tell you how ridiculous that the, the nostalgia feels come over me where I sit there and I get to explain to him who this character is and what the character does and how their, their relationship is. And my, my son will ask me, well, why does he do that, Dad? Well, because he's a bad guy. Because <laughs> he wants to trick you. He wants to take over. He wants to, you know, have power for himself. And my son looks over me and goes, oh, he's a bad guy. Yes. Now you got it, buddy. <laughs> so for me, I guess, doubly so, here we go. I'm an easy mark for Kevin Smith. So that alone. Um... And I'm an easy mark for nostalgia. If it was something that I enjoyed growing up, it's entirely possible I'm going to enjoy as an adult. Let's face it. And I should mention, um, I'm an easy mark for Kevin Smith, but there's no real Kevin Smith jokes in this series. Uh, The head uh, of Mattel, or I guess whoever is uh, the head of this division that wanted to recreate the animated version of Motu, Pretty much just said, hey, look, I, I loved He-Man growing up. I just want you to recapture that feeling I had as a child and bring that out. Bring that up to me again. Just that make it more realistic or more uh, dangerous for the characters. Like, you could believe that something would happen to these characters. And it's not just that they're going to have their status quo reset at the end of every episode. Um, Kevin Smith did something really great. I mean, this is not his... He said it himself. This is not his sandbox. He's playing with somebody else's toys. But he did a really good job taking these characters, putting them in these storylines, and continuing the the lore, the myth of the Masters of the Universe. So again, I hope for more seasons. If we get four, maybe five seasons, I'd be happy. If we are stuck with just part one, part two of this, and that's it, I, I, I feel like it'll be a... Uh, um, a loss to the fans at this point because they've done so well. And the voice cast, like I mentioned before, is so great to hear all these voices come together and bring these characters to life once again. So I think that's pretty much all I I have to say as far as that's concerned. There's so much uh, I could ramble on about. I enjoy it. And once again, Netflix has just got a great thing going. They it's This now falls into the idea of this is their Netflix original. Um, It falls into their... um, umbrella of original shows and programming because eventually they want to try just to fill the platform with their stuff so they're not having to lease out all the different things license i should say all the different movies or tv shows they have so much that they can play on their 
platform that it still makes them very uh, competitive compared to all the other streamers out there. So it's crazy. It's a lot of fun, but there you go. <laughs> I, I said all I can about Netflix and Motu at this point. So congratulations, guys, who uh, are, you know, in the writer's room and uh, behind the scenes for all of this. Uh, Bear McCreary, uh, who did the music for Battlestar Galactica, The Walking Dead. He does the the intro, the the theme for this time around, because they couldn't use the old theme. It's a different story, obviously. I don't know if it would help, actually, if you had the classic theme. I mean, sometimes you do have to refresh a few things here and there. So that's about it. That's all I really have to say on the subject matter at hand. I hope you guys enjoy the show. I'm sure I'll be talking about a bunch of different things coming out. Again, I'm trying to find different stories and points that I can talk about and make uh, make it worth your while. So I'm not just sitting here. I think I might reintroduce the idea of like the lightning round. Um, so I can just talk about little quick stories here and there that have that are happening. Because there are different things going on. I know we've lost some more people in the entertainment industry. Um... One of the members from ZZ Top recently passed away. Uh, Dusty Hill, I believe. Um, Bob Odenkirk was recently rushed to the hospital while he was filming the most uh, the la- the f- recent and last season of uh, Better Call Saul, which uh, he was hospitalized with a heart-related incident, they're calling it. So there's a bunch of things that I can talk about and cover, but the thing is, by myself, it's kind of hard to go into depth with a lot of these without somebody else to bounce off of back and forth i've mentioned before so that'll be taken care of uh, in the near future because i did get some new equipment that i'm going to be uh, using to hopefully bridge that gap in the next few weeks and we'll see how that plays out but the lightning round might not be a good a bad idea it worked back in the back in the day i believe uh i want to say it was matt peters from mighty inc that helped me named it uh was the the, the hot tag i think that's what it was called what was it called i have to go back <laughs> it's been so long i can't even remember my old seconds but uh, it's coming together. I'm having some fun. I'm putting this back uh, together in the home studio, and things will get back to where they are nice and uh, easy to do. Okay, now I'm just rambling even further. I hope you guys enjoyed listening to this. Uh, let me know what you think. If you're a fan of uh, Masters of the Universe, He-Man, whether it be the animated, or the cartoon, or even the live-action movie, give me a shout. Let me know what's going on. Send me a tweet at Rabblecast on Twitter. Uh, let's see, Rabblecast at gmail.com, the Facebook fan page. And uh, let's see what's happening. Oh, if you're on YouTube and you're checking out the, the show there, uh, like and subscribe. It helps us out. Rate us on iTunes or whatever platform you're listening on. It helps us, you know, rise up a little bit as far as uh, not even the rankings. I don't care if the show is top whatever. I just want the show to be visible so people can catch it, listen to it, and have fun. Let's put it that way. All right? Easy enough. Sounds good. Thank you for listening. We are the Rabblecast.